Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani More, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, welcome to Bespoken Bones, ancestors at the crossroads of sex, magic, and science, where we are in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. I'm your host, Pavani Moray, and I'm delighted to introduce you today to Keith Hennessy. Keith is an award-winning performer, choreographer, teacher, and organizer. He directs Circo Zero, a laboratory for live performance that plays with genre and expectation. He was born in a mining town in northern Ontario, Canada, and he lives in San Francisco and works regularly in Europe. Rooted in dance, his work embodies a unique hybrid of performance art, music, visual and conceptual art, circus, and ritual. He has been crafting works of genuine imagination and originality since the early 80s. These performances have been awarded a USA Kenner Fellowship, a New York Bessie, several Isadora Duncan Awards, a Goldie in 2007, and the Albert McDowell Fellowship in Dance in 2005. And you can find out more about his work, including his performances, residencies, talks, and teaching schedule at www.circozero.org. That's C-I-R-C-O-Z-E-R-O, circozero.org. Hi, Keith, and welcome. I am curious, what are these things here on the table that you've brought with you? When I was doing the oral defense of my dissertation, after I passed, my lead professor gave this to me. Check that out. And I was like, what is it? And then I pulled it open. Is it a little pointer? It's an antique eye makeup from like... Beautiful some earlier generation of theater. Oh, that's so neat. Isn't it amazing? Ancestors, dead people put on their makeup to go into the theater with that. Mm. It's mm. so amazing. That's great. Just interested in what are ancestors to you? I think ancestors are, well, right now, because I just left a redwood forest, um, I'm thinking of them as a rhizometric network meaning that they don't exist as, do you know what a rhizome is? Yeah, that they don't exist individually. Uh, they exist within ecosystems and larger than ecosystems. And the first level of ancestors is those who've come before us. And then I think when we get into invoking ancestors, I don't think we're calling every person who's ever died. We're, it's there's a sense of hierarchy or a designation. Like, we're calling the special dead, we're calling the honorable dead. I think earlier when you talked about a situation where you, where you were calling um, the ancestors who have done harm, but they, at the same time, they're still designated, they're still placeholder dead. And most recently, the kind of, like, consciousness, material, immaterial map that I've been working with, and that was material slash immaterial map that I've been working with, the, the other worlds are not differentiated by past and future. So ancestors are not only those who have come before us and been the teachers or the birthers or the wounders or whether they were the slaves or the colonialists, whether they were the artists or the judges, but they're also the future. The ancestors live in the same realm as the future, which means that we're not just, in a sense, in a symbiotic relationship with the past that we understand through like Western psychological processes, but we're also called from the desire of the unborn and from the future energies and selves, so that what we see as the material world and what we might call the present or the now is in this relationship to ancestors, which is not only the past, but also the future in, an, in a less differentiated space where time is more elastic already, like the way that we understand even a little bit about ritual time. 
or even say orgasmic time, like like any brief glimpse that we get of a time that seems outside of clock time. And it's like if you expand that notion into multiple dimensions beyond comprehension, it seems like ancestors can't just be the past. So that's where I've been thinking now about ancestors. Also, I've just worked with people, so I have their working definitions. Like, I think it's Michael Mead who had an idea of, like, that the ancestors are the special dead or the honorable dead. It's possible that he never said that, but that's my recollection of a Mike, of what I got from Michael Mead. Okay. And I think it's been, like, looking at actual maps or ways that people have tried to put into two dimensions a sense of the seen world and the unseen world, especially indigenous people. Um, I'm thinking of what Maladoma Somme learned from the Dagara people, that he comes from, he himself is Dagara from Burkina Faso and the southern part of Mali. You know, when I think of like the first time that I think he drew something that I tried to see as a map of the known world and the unknown world or the seen and the unseen, I started to realize that that ancestors was a, a more dynamic um, and elastic concept than just the great dead. Although I think that's how I probably use it the most, but most recently in teaching or thinking through it, I'm trying to allow it to be the great unborn also. Even those languages of dead and unborn are really just designators of like whether we link to them because of their work in the past or the future. But since consciousness circulates in these maps, ancestors are not an object outside of us and neither is the future. So we already are of like ancestors are available, not just like, cause you called them from some strange place, but cellularly, psychologically, energetically in us, in our environments, in our, you know, we're sitting at a wooden table with a wooden floor and wooden chairs in a house that was built from old growth redwoods. And the house has been standing for over a hundred years. And it's like, there's just ancestor energy action all over the place. I put uh, a railroad spike in front of us that's been painted gold, but the railroad's bike itself, which is iron, is like from deep in the ground. And it's quite possible it's from my hometown, which is the biggest source of iron ore in the world up through the 60s. Like, so, like my hometown, like the stainless steel of the post-war boom in the United States was built from the nickel, which was extracted from the ore under the ground in my hometown the whole country. So, like, that's just a sense of where I tried to be very expansive and sort of, in one way, not precious about ancestors and the sense that they're always there. You just need to make a choice to pay attention and, uh, or sense them, name them, and we're in it. It's the theme that has pervaded all of these interviews. Everyone has said that exact thing, mm -hmm. that the ancestors are in us. Yeah. It's not a separate... Thing. Yeah. People from many different cultures have said that. Yeah. It's interesting. How do you experience your ancestors and your ancestral relationships? How do you know them and feel them and relate with them? It's not very specific at times. I think one whole realm of where I use the language of the ancestors, but I don't really know what's happening, is a sense of feeling something between fate or forces that seem generated not just by me or my community or like something that I can witness, like where, where power or force or inspiration seem generated externally or internally, like in, in ways that seem less obvious, I often think is connected to ancestor. Um, can you give an example? Mm -hmm. I would say some intuitive art making that feels like I just pulled that out of nowhere. I have no idea what, how that happened. I think there's plenty of people who are like, that's God speaking, you know, and as an atheist of sorts that tries to imagine that deity is more of a poem than a reality. 
And then, of course, that's tricky because what works in the poetic or the symbolic um, is its own kind of real, right? So to say God is real then is, of course, God is real. Since I'm in a spiritual and intellectual practice of, like, in a sense, deconstructing deity, God is not real to me in that way. Like, that's not a poem that I'm working with. But so, I think sometimes when I can feel the lineage of an action, and that happens in art making, it happens in a protest, it happens in ritual, I feel some sense of the hand or the blessing, or sometimes it's just the gaze of the ancestors. And there are very few times when the gaze is actually my mother or my father. Like that's where the protection and or guidance is coming from in that way. And it's like a, again, my parents are totally inside of me and are of me and I am them. And so I could do a thing that say comes from habitually that that's under the influence of my mother. And that could seem something very banal and not ancestrally at all. But there are ways where something more intuitive or protection in danger, and I am aware of how much my mother looked out for me. Mm-hmm. That you feel her protection yes. in a dangerous situation. Well, or it's more like I feel the lingering resonance mm-hmm. of... Uh, her sense of safeguarding. There's very little woo that I won't interrogate, but, you know, I had a really bad fall, and it was the conditions under which some people would have died. I clearly did not die. I got banged up, and I broke some bones, and was carried away, and I walked a day later, you know, so... But when people... And my mother had recently died, And they were like, oh, for sure your mother was looking out for you. And I was like, oh, you're just making shit up. The more that I look at that from some other sense, I feel all kinds of ways where that could be true. And then I think it's, well, it's actually some of the ways of being in the world that my parents and my family taught me to be that constructed the body that I have that survived that fall, that did things in the air, even though I had fainted, my body righted itself in the air, I was upside down, and I landed on my feet. And there are some physical principles of how I swung off this object, and that I had been a diver for years as a child. So flipping and inversions in air, it's like, that's not most people's jam, but I had clearly done it hundreds, if not thousands of times. But my fall happened from passing out, so there was a a loss of consciousness, and I still flipped in the air. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those... It's interesting to think about the ways that a future pulled me, in one way, uh, through that, but also that a past constructed a possibility for me to survive that in a great way. But I I feel it in all kinds of ways, like because I'm having a talk with you and because we're thinking about sexual healing as a sort of larger context of how we know each other, what links our research, that, that I know your thesis advisor for 30 years, you know, is it 30 years? That might be exaggerating. Since 1988. Yeah, Almost. Sure. Yeah. That, and we did, a, you know, like a lot of the, when I was, you know, more uh, directly focused in areas of sexual healing, I felt like, figuring out what ancestors were, figuring out what the work that was done before, calling that into support, is also a way of saying, do some reading, do some history reading, activate yourself, pay your respects with actual information, not just with some intuitive woo that I think I I know things. And the more that it was, you know, that we would educate ourselves about um, who we were and where we come from in that way, And whether that was as gay men, whether that was as queers, whether that was as sexual healers slash sacred intimates slash sacred whores, you know, even the sacred whore world and language, it's like half of that is just some crazy ass nostalgic projection, you know, woo fantasy. And then the rest is like, 
nope, you hit a certain moment and you're like, this is true. This is true for me right now. We, like, it's central to feminist and queer historicizing that we have to trust at least some of the intuition, even if we counterbalance it with, with logics and written histories, we have to go. But there's giant gaps in histories. We are the gaps in the history. We have to somehow project lived experience into voids of experience and piece things together. You're talking about a moment of recognizing ancestral consciousness yeah. in your body. Yes. Would you talk about that moment? Sure. Let's go for one. I mean, it's so tricky. There's, in, in some ways, there's a lot, and I'm tempted to shoot myself into the further past, like the early 90, uh, what I would consider the pioneering days of body electric. But I would just go with something that happened last weekend, which was I got the remnants of a maypole all the ribbons, the woven ribbons, and they were going to be thrown out. And I asked Jack Davis, who's a pagan witch in the same tradition, who recognized the sort of specialness of the maypole and the idea that a hundred people wove this, and they did it in a dance that's been done for a thousand years plus. And so there was all kinds of, not just community vibe into it, but history embedded into this weaving. And um, I asked him to make me a corset out of it that I then wore and I combined three sort of iconic things from Europagan traditions. So a green man and I built a whole head slash wig out of plants and shrubbery. The maypole as the corset, so the weaving of a community wound around me, but also the weaving through history and time. And then... I wore these stilts that are these, uh, they're very cyborg looking, but they're modeled, you know, they look like um, half of a deer's leg. You know, they're curved and they're made for bouncing. Yeah, I've seen those. So, and people instantly recognize things like the fawn, the maypole, and the green man, right? So you could read all this um, ritual objects into it. The fawn also has this whole history, you know, not just the stag, but then like in the history of dance because of the dance by Nijinsky that's over 100 years old now, or just about 100 years old right now, that is Afternoon of a Fawn, uh, that is a, a dance about a mythical creature that's, you know, in a sense part animal, part human. And um, so here I was, this cyborg fawn, futuristic past and I felt like I didn't have a lot of time to work on this dance so I just performed it for an audience and then when I talked to people afterwards the things that they read into it the where they saw tragedy where they saw power where they saw like there was people were really moved and I was like I tapped into that's those are in quotes tapped into something What's that something? And it's like, I think that there are like energetic tracks, like almost like ley lines of practices, of consciousnesses. And that's, I think, really related to ancestor. And I think I didn't just make up a dance that was moving. I put myself into practices and sacred objects. And then I threw myself into the center of us. I also took the audience out of their seats without really planning what what or why I was doing it and had them in a circle. And then when it was over and I, you know, and even Sarah Shelton Mann was like, that was amazing. And I said, I don't even know what I'm doing. And she said, that's your magic. Mm-hmm. So somewhere in the, what practices have I been through that are grounded in history and ancestor, yeah. meeting intuitive choices that I made, meeting I tapped into some, like, and I say a groove because that's, I think, one of the earliest ways someone ever described it. It's like grooves of a record in a sense. Like, not all intuition is the wilderness, is what I mean to say. That there are archetypes and there are pathways. And sometimes you get on it and you're in it. You know you're on something. And I think that with that dance, just, you know, people a dance for 50 people. And the way that they didn't all know what path they were on, but they knew they went, they went somewhere. They had a journey. They had a bodily experience. They had an emotional experience. They were moved by it. 
And I was just trying to, you know, sort of jump into the ether to see, like, if you do these things correctly, will you, will the rest flow? And something flowed. And I think that often about improvisation. I, I think that with ritual practice, it's more obvious because we often will call specifically ancestors and look for support to do something. But I think with, with improvised creative practice, it's less obvious how and who you're connecting, you know, what and who you're connecting with. So, and I think what my, my experience inside that dance was one of both being driven and being lost. When it was over, I didn't know what had happened. So it was only through reflection and hanging out with people did I start to understand that something had happened. It reminds me of kind of like being ridden. It's very much like that. I don't use that language only because that belongs to a right. practice that I haven't been in. Um, although I've been right next to it in many experiences. Like I, I have been a guest in uh, rituals of multiple cultures. And it's very much like being written. And, and I would say the other place where it's similar to a Santeria or Voodoo and Lukumi kind of experience is this sense of you study the dance, like to be ridden by, you know, an Orisha that you haven't learned the dance for is, t is chaotic. Like you could fall on the ground and writhe around, you could be hurt, you could not understand how to do it, uh, you could miss the opportunity. You know, there's a number of things that can happen. But to be ridden by the Orisha where you know the dance is to then be in this partnership in a different kind of way. And I think that me improvising and saying, okay, well, I put on the maypole, I wore the green, I had the deer leg, like I became the cyborg fawn or the cyborg stag or, you know, whatever, that that yes, I, there's a dance that I know how to do and then I let, I let the energy happen in that way. The other thing that feels slightly different for me about the language of being ridden, and I'm sure that people in that practice would also have their own way of saying what I'm about to say, but I don't only think of it as an external that comes down onto me, which is how that language can be translated. And I, I'm careful about directional terms with ritual, deity, magic, religion, to not continually recreate up-down axes and to allow peripheral axes, spiral pathways uh, to happen. So, because there is a sense sometimes of, I think it maybe that's just maybe how neophytes understand it or people outside of the culture, but that there's this horse and then the energy comes down on and rides. And I think, especially as a, the kind of way that I've trained as a dancer and ritualist, um, and as a sex healer, is that the energy is coming through in and out in multiple ways. So but there's an attention to directionality. Yeah. And, and a, do you choose it, or is it? Are you open? Well, to I'm very happens? like I, for example, do very little. Like open my crown chakra and wait for skies to come down into body, yeah. uh, or even a pagan practice where it's like you're working the vertical axis a bunch, like rooting down and opening up. Okay. I'm thinking of a much more multi-directional thing. Is like it, one that it's already in me, so it's about activating and releasing what's, what is. And then the other is that it can come from everything. Breathing air, sitting chairs, new people coming into the room. Did the, that experience of that dance, it sounds like embodying ancestral consciousness, did it feel collaborative? Definitely. I would say the other way that I work, though, in terms of whether it's improvisational performance or leading a ritual and often teaching, is that I'm very much in a collaborative experience with audience, even if they say and do nothing. Like, I'm reading people, their energies, their histories, like, in the live moment. So, often I feel like the role of leader, facilitator, teacher in that moment, even if the reverse is also true, right? To be a mirror for other people's leadership and teacher and to be a student of the moment, but is often to be the channel for not just my own, like I don't ever see myself as the channel of just my own trip, but of the network that's available in the room. 
So like, I don't just think I'm collaborating with what I called in, but as much as I can activate any people in the audience, and I'm often scanning the room and feeling like, oh, these few people over here and there are super activated. I'm now working with whatever they're bringing through. Like, you know, in dance, we sometimes will talk about the backspace because people bring everything from the front. And it's like, that's another direction that's happening that's not vertical, right? It's from the back to the front. Right. And it's a very obvious sense of history is behind you and the future is in front of you. And Is that how you know it? It's one of the ways, yeah. 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 The ancestors are behind you. Well, I mean, I think they're also beneath, above, and in front of, like I say. But I think that in terms of time, like... And this is also a Michael Mead thing, that an initiation ritual is, is a turning of the gaze from behind to the front. Like it's a turning away from the mother, the father, the family of origin, and it's a turning to the future that involves death. But it's also a, I'm no longer just where I came from, I'm now going forward. I'm not tracking constantly. Are, are they with me? At a certain point, it's like a turning to, in a sense, my own life, um, and now they're at your back, and they literally have your back, but you are going forward with, like, not with them. They're no longer sweeping the pathway in front of you, or shoveling the snow in front of you, or figuring out which school you're going to, or uh, deciding what kind of food you're going to eat. You're now going forward. You have those practices behind you, and I think in dance, often, I mean, you can move backwards, for sure, and it's like, I, I notice myself, I even for a dancer, I do it too infrequently. I turn to face the direction I'm going, generally. So there is a sense of, like, the propulsion coming from behind. Mm -hmm. But yes, when you said collaborative, I feel like it's collaborative not just with uh, some sense of ancestor, which, again, keeps being a very expansive idea for me, uh, but it's also, if I'm activating ancestors, there's probably other people in the room that are not just because they are anything they have ancestor but their emotional and psychic bodies are now activated also yeah. so the practice of activating ancestral consciousness it sounds like at least in that example included the pieces of costuming that you were wearing that triggered for at least for that northern european pagan crowd right that those remembrances those maybe even on an embodied level yeah yeah well, I think that's true for people who recognize the objects, but I think the people who don't recognize the objects, who are just seeing a human move and having symbols activated, like we right? Don't like have to know what it is. To yeah. Be well, also you can read things like, you know, I work a lot with precarity and danger, so I was on these stilts that seemed like I might fall over, and then they bounce, and so, you know, people are also just having mirror neuron experiences of. Like, he might fall, he might crash into me, he, I'm worried about the room, or now, wow, he's moving so fast, or um, like awe experiences. All of those are triggered, and then any of those can become gateways to what I would call the transpersonal. So, I'm going to make a leap here, yeah. and tell me if I'm following. It sounds like you're saying that one person embodying those practices can awaken those kinds of consciousnesses for other people. Yes, I think so. Maybe not on a conscious level, but on a maybe on a conscious level. Yeah, I think on multiple levels. They might not be interpreted the same. Mm -hmm. So the language, by the time it gets to language, it might not be the same thing. But I also think it's not so much that the dancer ritualist is doing something specific that the audience then experiences. It's more like they're opening them, the audience, up to their own spiritual or energetic or transpersonal experiences. And who knows what work they need to do or who they need to talk to. Like, I'm just thinking about how this technology could be applied in a situation like this. So, of, like, collective sexual healing, right? And it sounds, like, possible to... Uh, to activate, like if, for example, we were going to work with, you know, I do a lot of work with trans people and the trans ancestors, right? And mm -hmm. so, like, activating people's awareness of trans ancestors, of, of maybe calling them by name or having items that represent them or somehow, like, 
Yeah. Maybe, but more on the like kind of the um, the archetypal level rather than the personal level. But this is that place where whether we talk about the transcestors or the dancestors, as I sometimes will write and sort of thank in the program, you know, thank this person, thank that person, and then of course you want to thank the dancestors, you know. But this is one of those places where modes of consciousness talk to each other, right? So if I learn about the transcestors, their success, their failure, their struggle, their beauty, their innovation, their righteousness, then it's like that sooner or later does something to my imaginal being, like, and my heart being, and I am more possible. And I think that's true. Like, you know, I identify as cis. I'm not just identified by others as cis. I identify as cis. And it's like, cis people can have that, we can have that sense of possibility and potential expanded by learning about the transcestors, for example. Or being in the presence of trans people who embody or invoke transcestors and you see them change, like be empowered or strengthened with a sense of history. So that's where it's like you learn history there and that expands or opens a gateway or a doorway or a window of perception, you know, within the within yourself that you're like, more is possible from this learning, from reading a book, from hearing about a friend, from a friend, or being guided by you, you know. So that's where it's like I think these things talk to each other. And I think that there are some people who are profoundly sensitive and need less practice than others. But the rest of us need practice. What are the practices? For me, practices involve reading, actual books, words. I'm a reader. I, that's not a compulsory. That's just one of my practices. I have been, you know, my fairy name is Cousin, and I've been a visitor in many kinds of ritual. And I've been in and around people practicing rituals, like trying to communicate with more expanded worlds, uh, trying to create magic through shifts of consciousness for over 30 years. And so I don't like a year to go by without having sat in a sweat lodge. I do several rituals with reclaiming every year. I make sure that in some of my own teaching, I don't just teach the very first level class, but every now and then I go, okay, I need this one to be like a deeper, bigger experience that demands more of everybody. And we all take a trip together. I don't like a year to go by without uh, one or two psychedelic experiences ecstasy, mushrooms especially, you know, so things like where I'm activating. And then physically, I like to just stay in a physical practice, like make sure that I'm dancing. If a month of too much reading and writing or teaching went by to then like, okay, give yourself an excuse to get back into studios or working with other bodies. And I think there's also a practice of like a collaborating practice that's very much what I call practice, whether that's about ritual or making performance or dancing together. Or yesterday we had a meeting um, at, with the neighbors and it's like all kinds of people came over. Starhawk came over, new neighbors from the building, a neighbor from, and we sat around and we collectively read a book together to go to try to work through these issues in this book. So all of those are practices for me. And I think that Again, it's a thing that I got from Maladoma 20 years ago, but he talked about, like, someone close to death and someone just born are the closest to the other world in terms of the horizon of time mm -hmm. and have the least need for practice to be in contact with ancestors or the unseen worlds. Makes sense. And the rest of us adults unless we're those one in 10,000 super psychic, way more sensitive than everyone people and have the ego slash whatever else we need to be able to assimilate that and not crash. So if we're not that person, well, the rest of us need practices. And those practices, even if they're experimental art practices, still have lineages and histories. And those things link us to, you know, these pathways of energy and these archetypes of energy. Like, I think it's a, 
someone was trying to have, you know, James Hillman, I think, was trying to explain, you know, he was, do you know who James Hillman is? James Hillman was a protege of Carl Jung and got pretty big. He's worth checking out someday. But James Hillman, you know, someone was asking him, what is an archetype exactly? And this was just an oral talk. And he was talking about the unconscious, not as just undifferentiated, like, you know, a wandering far forest in the dark. But he was like, no, it's like where groups of energy, like, there's clusters of things that may have character. And then maybe that then is an Arisha and maybe that is just the victim, you know, or like, but there's an archetype there and there can be new ones made and old ones die off because a culture or a society isn't really jamming to that archetype anymore, or it's just hovering around for a thousand years waiting to be needed or recognized again or, but it was this interesting way of seeing something approaching deity or ancestor, but with a lot fuzzier edges like that energy clusters around certain traits, and then if you could see it all together, you might even give it a name. But looked at from another angle, you might have missed it entirely. You would have just been like I'd passed through a brief fog for a second on my way to somewhere clear. I'm curious about how, um, in your experience, ancestor practice you just named supports your development of sexual wellness. Well, it's interesting because I, um, I was thinking about one of the places where I sort of guide others into thinking through ancestors is in doing work around death and dying practices, which are practices that I began at the same time as I learned sexual wellness, sexual healing practices, learned, developed, intuited. So it's interesting because that's where I talk about it. In terms of sexual wellness, I feel like one of the larger mechanisms of queer oppression is shame. And so one of the things that having, like, understanding some things and that some of that's embodied and sensing and some of that is from just being in gay and queer cultures and some of that is from reading and knowing and learning history helps eradicate and even banish shame and even like ridicule shame like shame no then doesn't have power in the face of some of our grand histories mm -hmm. well in that knowing of it like i say it also happens when you're around people and they carry a certain pride or righteousness and then so i think that that's one place that i think that that makes it like having a sense of ancestor and specifically gay and queer ancestors, I think is crucial to my, my sexual pleasure, which is connected to my sexual wellness. That there's a sense of pride that's instilled. From... Yeah, pride is tricky. So I'd say I wouldn't focus on the pride, but I would focus on the, the beauty of being or the beauty of unconditional being. And maybe what that is, is to be around people who are unashamed yeah. and carry that. They're shameless. Yeah. Shameless is, is a great trait. <laughs> and I'm concerned for our young people because it feels like shame is so back. Like there's just, we were at the Russian baths the other night and so many of the young people are not naked. They're all wearing bathing suits. And it's just like, why are you doing that? And I understand there's a number of reasons for it. And it's not just about shame, but there's definitely a reinvestment in that culture with the private and also with a gendered privacy in this place that, again, historically would be naked, but historically wouldn't, would either be family, community, or would be gender separated. Mm -hmm. And we work, you know, like a hippie culture goes for undifferentiated space with strangers. Like, so, you know, some of the things you might set up for different kinds of protection, like oh, well, I don't know any of those people, so maybe I should only do an all-women space or an all-queer space. It's like, it's none of that. So then you're like, okay, maybe bathing suits make sense in a culture that has so many other sexual wounds. Why, why play into it? But anyway, whatever. I get concerned about the role that shame plays and how, um, in a sense, prissy and protective and private, I feel like the pop culture of the moment is. 
you know, which we could chart as part of this, the neoliberal takeover of the, of the hippie ruptures of the 60s. Do you know what I mean? Like we've been watching them expand in some ways ever since then and in other ways continually be, you know, re-corralled or constrained um, and turned into niche, you know. It sounds like you're saying that as a in counterpoint to what's happening in pop culture, that to really bring to the forefront the glorious queer dead could be a remedy for um, sure and a support for sexual wellness yeah developing sexual wellness Mm -hmm. like really having great sex positive role models who have forged yeah well i think and i think it's even bigger than that i feel like there are many cultures where some version of the queer is linked to the ritual practices is has specific roles in the making of a culture has certain abilities to transcend some social boundaries and it's like being exposed to that being exposed to those histories being exposed to bodies that carry that information has been really helpful for me i think it's really easy given you know everything that's happened in the last 500 years in and by you know the european diaspora it's really easy to pathologize anal sex and as someone who likes it, it's like, you have to work at it. I mean, you have to, I mean, I guess there are some people who can just like it, but I feel like even I'm around people all the time who are into butt sex, but at the same time still have all kinds of trips about it and all kinds of fears about it and all kinds of like, but I wouldn't ever share that with anybody. Um, like I wouldn't let anyone else know that. And, and I think even within gay and queer cultures, there's still, you know, even the other day, someone was asking me questions, but they could own, they could not escape the language of bottoming and topping. And I was like, well, so here's why I don't really use that language, because some of what's hot about sex is the sense of role and power. But actually, that's not the only thing. Like, there's also sensation, there's other ways that taboo operates where you're both in the taboo together, you're not like having something done to you or doing something to someone like that, that that language is also tricky. And I think having my own version of a positive, like a a, a set of positive associations that are grounded historically and feel good in my body around butt sex is, it's really important. And it doesn't, the mainstream society around me, including even just mainstream gay society, with its shaved buttholes and its everyone must be absolutely clean inside and out kind of language and practices is not a friend of sexual wellness for me. It's obsessive. It's embodying way too many aspects of, you know, the Christian and colonial takeover of the body and social constriction on the individual and all of that kind of stuff. And I think the other thing that really has made a difference for me in terms of like, learning about sex has been to understand sex as a experience outside of production and reproduction like not that it's outside of the functional because i think pleasure is has its functions um and so does play but when we understand sex as play and pleasure and not only as functional we start to open up also to the part of sex that's mysterious where we don't fully understand what happens when two people connect in this way or more people. I'm especially fascinated with the whole, like with penetration, like what happens when we're inside each other's bodies that there's something that's not just physical or even personal about it. There's something transpersonal. There's the history of the act. There's how many trillions of beings through history have put one thing inside the other thing. And then, you know, as a person with a dick, it's like, like the dick inside something else or a dick inside of me. Like there's just, you know, and I feel similar in a sense with both fingers and tongues in a way of like this, the ways that bodies become each other by entering. And I think that, that there's a transpersonal aspect to that. That the ways bodies become each other by entering. Yeah. What about erotic practice either for the benefit of the ancestors with the ancestors, anything there? 
I would say that's an area where my practice is pretty infrequent. And that would mostly be, I feel like my home-based erotic practice is only occasionally do I, like, drop out of either porn or fantasy or, like, very personal pleasure into a bigger trip. But I would say a few times a year, like, say, three, I have sex experience outdoors, usually by myself, uh, but not always. And those are the ones where I'm really clear that, of, like, the idea of a sex offering. And I would say the other place where I do sex offering, and I for sure always offer as much to the, the living and the still to come, is about, and that's also true with oil actions, right? But if I'm doing something that's more in public erotic space or teaching space, then it's very much about making an offering to those who still are, are to come, that we need to keep creating experimental public or shared communal spaces where things can happen. So I definitely see that as like sex service. Sometimes it's gratitude. I feel like one of the main languages to speak with ancestor and the other world and the unseen worlds is through gratitude, which is sort of the, f the flip side of the coin of saying, I need help and right. can you come? Although recently I've been working with this Annie Lamott, the poet Annie Lamott has proposed that prayer is thank you, help, and wow. Because I had been working with this kind of dyad, like the two easy ways to think through prayer is thank yous and I need help, right. or we need help. And then adding wow to that has been really interesting. Like that instead of triggering wow immediately means thank you, like thank you for this amazing day, um, or you know thank you for your research, but it's like, wow, your research is amazing. <laughs> Like, and that wow is its own kind of prayer, um, to be odd. But so, yeah, I definitely, like, for sure some outdoor, you know, sort of eco-sex feels much more like I do offerings of gratitude and calling help for others, not for myself as much. Like through sex as yeah. offering or sex yeah. as prayer practice? Yeah, through sex as prayer practice. And, yeah. and I don't share that very much with my boyfriend uh, on any articulate level. Although I think every now and then when we're in a really strong, like, this is really happening, I allow my gratitude or my wow to include the history of this moment and the future of this moment and the space that we create for future faggots mm -hmm. by fucking, mm -hmm. yeah. by fucking without shame, by fucking without being young, by fucking without shaving, you know, like... Transgressive, yeah, or antithetical to pop culture, yeah, strategies that you're yeah. working with, yeah. That's some things I think about. Um, what do you think about sexual wounding? Like we were talking earlier about transgenerational sexual trauma, and what do you think about working with ancestors to heal that or to? Mm. It was so weird because you asked me just as I touched this object. This is a a very tiny art project I did called Faggots, and I got tons and tons of these. And it was about taking the charred sticks out of the fire and then glittering them and then calling it Faggots. And I built this whole series of them, and then I gave people these little teeny sculptures. Faggots being the sticks yes. in the fire as well. As yeah. The... Yeah. Okay. Um, but usually we see the faggot as the bundle of sticks, and then there's this reference to the faggots in the fire. Um, but it was like, what if we I now take the charcoal back from the fire and then glitter it? Because there's a pretty big queer wound. Oh, my God. Well, there's, I think, and also I think it's a complex wound, right? Like, so, and there's a whole, you know, obviously there's a whole piece of it that's deeply intertwined with what misogyny is, but not only. And I think that there's something that's deep within the transition-ish of in certain cultures from one kind of tribalism to the tribalism that is modernism, that the sense that people have of being of a community or of a tribe is broken in some ways, but then social control and sexual control is still exerted in other ways, but we now have no logic behind it. 
like what it is to be marked sexually as a member of a group has really no relevance for us. And so some, we, we can be like, let's throw that out. Like, I don't need to be circumcised. That's stupid. So throw that out. But then we also are controlled sexually in all these other kinds of ways, but we have no, there's no real basis of it. And then after that, you're supposed to be this individual who has nothing to do with a tribe. And I think that people living closer to smaller groups of people had more of a stake in controlling each other's sexuality and having a sense that your sexuality was very much connected to the continuance of a culture. And I don't just mean about making babies. Like, I mean that there were roles to play, that there were social roles and that the taboos existed for certain kinds of things. And I feel like both colonial and capitalist practices specialize in co-opting culture to use against people for these other kinds of social control and this profit drive. So, like, when we figure out what the gay wound is, what the gay wounds are, it's like, well, we have to bring in this whole project of misogyny and we have to look at sort of how, you know, like, colonialism, slavery, capitalism create another whole set. We need to look at these other kinds of things. We need to look at how linked racism is to the colonial and slavery practices and then what we end up with as permissible sexuality for us. And then you have this sort of there's the too much sexual wound and then there's the with the absolute denial, right? Like to, to not acknowledge that people exist as sexual beings is like this wound producing thing. And it also creates all kinds of alienation and, you know, other kinds of imbalance. So anyway, once we have all that wound and then you start to realize that we carry it intergenerationally and multigenerationally, or you said, what did you say? Transgenerationally. Then what, What's a healing practice? What does healing look like? I mean, I would say we can only do one thing at a time. Like each generation gets one step. We get to make one step. So I do think there is some sense of that to participate in collective struggle, like in shared struggle around the wounds, around sexual wounding is, is righteous, is beneficial to the future, is is a prayer of thanks to the ancestors, like that we're working past and future there. But I think what is a sexual healing and when is that true and when is that about pleasure and when is it not, I think that we still know very little about. You know, the, we've, we've already been through one wave of, if everyone could have an orgasm, the world would be a better place, or, um, you know, and then all the hookers let us know that they already work with all the politicians and the people in power and they've given them great head and um, those people still killed people the next day. So obviously don't make a direct link between someone just got the service and pleasure that they really wanted, even if it seemed more collaborative than the power play of just that some transactional sex can be. But, and I, I only say that because it's just, it's more complicated than just if someone can get over their own shame, did the world change? I think the answer is yes, but at the same time as it's yes and, you know, like I think that it's quite complicated what the relationship of the personal and the political really are. So I'm talking around it. I'm not sure what all what it is. But do you think that this, the relationship you were talking about earlier, where you were in collaboration with that force and allowing it to act through your body, is there a way to, to do that? Like, yeah, okay, although, I, don't, I can't even identify the whole wound, right? Right. But is there a way through my body that, like, what moves through me and my own sexuality, if, if I'm expanded enough to hold that, mm -hmm. can that start to tend the greater, the greater wounding? I well, I think for sure. I mean, I think in that way, everything's connected. So I think, yes. I think the scale of the wounding is quite big. And the weird thing is, is that it's not only a historical fact. It's ongoing. Right. Right. So we're... Right culture. Yeah, we're... Yeah. It's like watching Trump do shit right now that you're like, we're going to be paying for this as a people, not just in 10 years or 20, but for multiple generations. Like, the scale of the backlash is fucking severe. 
he took the term LGBT off the White House website the same day that they took off Spanish translations of shit. You're like, unbelievable. So yeah, that can go back up in four years. Could even go up in one year. But how many people just got empowered in their like, queers are wrong? Millions, millions. And a bunch of them are going to raise their children with that and feel even strengthened, you know. So anyway, that's just one piece. We could then do it again with indigenous and pipeline and this, and I mean, forever. So wounds are ongoing is all I mean to say. And that I don't know, I, what I think right now is I think that when you look at how resistance is transforming, and I would use Standing Rock and the Idle No More movement in Native worlds, and I would use Black Lives Matter as another one. In both of those worlds, we're looking at a kind of female and queer leadership that we haven't seen in the last hundred years. We're looking at um, an integration of self and collective care and the importance of ritual in the movements in a way that no social justice movement has carried in quite the same way, even different from the role of, say, black Christianity in the civil rights movement, I think we're seeing something different. And these are people who are foregrounding multi-generational trauma and knowing that it that it's one of the main things they're up against. And so that their eye on like what the goal is of where they're going is super expansive and super deep. Like so I think we're in something. And I, I would just you know it's like I'm not a therapist, but it's like you look at the work that's happening in the Bay Area in terms of people who are becoming therapists and going down healing worlds, and it's like more people than ever before are focused on trauma, are recognizing trauma as multi-generational, are looking at the way that it works, and it's like we're in it. I don't know what all that means, and I, I don't feel as present in gay and queer sexual healing spaces on a day-to-day, -day, so it's like I'm not sure where that's operating or how that's functioning, but I feel like that's the shit that is up and that the most forward thinking and acting people right now are working on that level. I mean, there's a really beautiful video of these people and I'm trying to think, are they called Black Seed? The Black Seed Collective? Anyway, a group of people, uh, all of African descent, who shut down the Bay Bridge on Martin Luther King Day a year ago. And the interview with the person who does the most talking, it's a video link, I could show it to you. But she refers to it continually around like resistance as self-care, resistance as a ritual, the ceremonial aspects, how they built an altar before they started to the dead. And it's like, these are people who drove cars onto the bridge, parked them, ran chains through the cars to then people standing between them and shut down the Bay Bridge, you know. They were just extremely well organized and they did it. And I think they're collect connected to the same people who shut down BART at an earlier time where they linked themselves th through locks and chains onto and off of BART so that BART couldn't leave. I mean, high risk activities. But when they talk about it, the words ritual and care come up through it. It's really amazing. And so what can a single action do? What can one person jerking off in the trees and offering themselves up do? I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't want to get too invested in thinking that that's that important of an activity, even if it's a really important activity, because it's too easy to be Pollyanna about how we think we change society through actions. And I think that, again, some people, maybe it makes sense for them to hang out in the ritual or the symbolic or the personal embodied work is where the bulk of their work is, and that's great. They don't need to march in the street. But I think that at least some of us need to be thinking systemically and looking at the relationship between the legislative, the street protest ritual, the court ritual, the secret underground sex rituals, and, and the occasional forays into, you know, an actual public sex ritual. Like, I don't think you were ever around when we did the fag sex, homo sex, with the homo hex. So Jack Davis and I, for five years, twice a year, organized uh, a public raising of sexual energy at Castro and Market Street, at Castro and 18th. 
And we did it on uh, Halloween and Pink Saturdays. And part of it was about reclaiming the space for queer, in a sense. But it was also like, what is it to actually raise erotic energy? So um, the smallest we ever were was maybe 10. The biggest was 50. But like 50 with 10 live drummers. And we would make a huge circle and just dance naked. And then there'd be making out and touching. There wasn't like sex sex from that way but there was a whole sense of like running erotic energy running it with each other running it with the crowd the erotic energy of the tees of the naked dancing of the spine undulating of the hips pumping with drumming and we did it like i say for five years so maybe it happened 10 times and those were you know sort of embedded within pagan practices and radical fairy practices um which are practices where the elements, the ancestors, a notion of a feminist spirituality are very influential. Did we change some people's lives? Did some people have shifts of consciousness from that? For sure. Did some people have embodied experiences that they had never had before, whether doing or watching? For sure. Was that one small piece that we played in addressing the queer wound, in claiming public space for queers, in making a whole bunch of other things possible? You're taking the long term, you yeah if we're making magic and we're making queer sexual magic and, and we're looking at all these things, speaking to ancestors to deal with the future, um, to reshape the, like we actually have to reshape the past. That's one of the things when we're working with ancestors, we're not just rewriting the future. We're actually rewriting the past. We're actually having to frigging excavate like yes. petrified scabs, not just like bloody scabs, petrified scabs, which demand another kind of like, love beaming to even change at all. It's like, it's just how to stay grounded in what actually is happening or not, and also to trust that you can't know all the... No, can't see it all. No, and we for sure can't see all the futures. So, that's some things I think about in all of that. That's great. Thank you <laughs> so much. I feel so blessed to be able to sit here with you this afternoon and listen. Thank you. And share... I mean, not just what you're saying now, but receive from you all of the gift of your lineages and all the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. just, I do feel very, um, like I just get to come to San Francisco and really experience, you know, the work of my elders, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and build on that. And I feel so grateful. Yeah. Keith, I want to thank you for all that you've shared today and actually really thank you for the work that you do in the world. And listeners, if you would like to know more about Keith's work, uh, you can visit www.circozero.org. And thanks for listening to this episode of Bespoken Bones. I'm Pavani Moray, and we'll be back next time with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. <laughs>